Houndsman XP fans, you're asking, and we are delivering. This is going to be a super episode for you. We've been getting questions on our social media platforms and through private messages, emails about training. I got some follow-up on scent in this episode, and we are going to dive in and talk about the wolf and the recent delisting of the wolf. So you're not going to want to miss this episode. I want you to sit back and enjoy this episode. It's Lauren, Seth, and I, and we're just having discussions about the issues that are important to you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening to Houndsman XP. I'm living the ultimate hermit life right now. Yeah, well, but you're, you're high not, speed hermit. That's true. I'm not. I am kind of a traveler. Yeah. I'm just a uh, highway man. Okay. You're a the high sword speed and hermit pistol by man. my side. Right. <laughs> what do you think? What you got on your mind today, Chris, for the episode? Well, I'm actually uh, thinking of, that we're going to answer some questions from our listeners. We're going to talk, talk about wolves a little bit. We're going to okay. talk about the uh, issues with delisting the wolves and the processes for making rules to manage wolves, especially in the upper Midwest, because Lauren uh, talked about that. And so we got the COVID girl, Lauren Branny, mm -hmm. on, on the scene here. So yep. that's that's what's on my mind, and uh, talk about it. I want to talk about a couple new projects I've got here with pups and and things like that. So pups, yeah, Works for me, yeah. I, I thought got, I saw a new pup. Well, I've got I've actually got three here. I've got Axel. I've got a new addition to the uh, the brat pack with Axel. He's a. Uh, I came home from Montana, and I came home to a pit bull terrier so uh he's about 16 weeks old maybe 19 weeks old 20 hmm. weeks somewhere around in there super cool dog super laid back super smart um just going through the socialization stuff with him the only and trying to get him house broke he does he's kind of a sissy he doesn't like it when it rains so he doesn't like to go outside <laughs> well then he needs to live here because it doesn't rain here ever <laughs> oh he, yeah he'd love it there he love it there, but the pit bull is a uh, is a new venture for us as far as uh, as far as dogs was this go. On, was this uh, on purpose? Like we are going to get a pit bull? No, oh, okay. no, it was more of like a uh, an emotional decision and reaction from my wife. She saw a cute little puppy on for adoption from a friend of hers on Facebook, and <sighs> that's how we got it. And now uh -huh. you have a new dog. <laughs> yeah, but he's cool. He's cool. I'm. I, he's probably not going to make any kind of a hunting dog or anything. He's super gamey. Uh, he's got pretty good prey drive and things like oh, that. Yeah. But um, he's uh, he's pretty cool. He's rowdy. He can be rowdy, but he can also be super chill and laid back. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing to me the just the natural instinct uh, when somebody pulls in or knocks on the door. You know, his first reaction is to bark. Mm. And, um, they, yep. They just need a lot of exercise, believe it or not. Oh, they yeah. A lot of energy. Yep. Yeah. He's, um, he gets a lot of it. He, when I, when I'm riding the plots, he'll always, he'll always go along. I put four miles, um, uh, on the plots the other morning, just stretching them out and getting them, getting them legged up a little bit. And mm. oh, I wish I could do that. He went the whole There's, way. There's nowhere Dang. to do that here. I've just got Unlucky. a track in my field, and I just do laps. Mm. And, yeah. it's, and it's pretty cool doing it that way because, um, you know, the, the plots know that when we're doing that, it's not free-for-all hunting time. So, right. you know, being place learners and things like that, then they uh, they are used to that. And we can talk about that a little bit because I've got, I've got several questions about training that have come in, but, uh, you know, that's one thing that we've talked about in the past was the, uh, you know, dogs are place learners. And when you put them in the same places and do the same things with them, they pick up on things pretty quick. So, mm -hmm. um, even though, even though they, they're used <clears throat> to, to go on hunting and stuff in the side by side, they know, 
as soon as I drop them out of that thing and we're in the field that it's time to, to put in some miles and, and things like that. And I actually just tell them, I just tell them to road, you know, mm-hmm. just give them a command. And they're like, okay, here we go. And away <laughs> we go. I always exercise my crew on foot around the canyon land around my house. And exactly their hunting strategy is, is really um, defined by the area we're at in those canyon lands. Those, those dogs just work the high ridges and they'll just run to each ridge and stand there and stare looking for movement. And if they don't see anything, they'll just move to the next one. And we walk about, eh, I walk maybe three miles and they probably run around like five total. And then we home, we head home, do that about mm, four or five days a week. Yeah, that's so, cool. It's good for them. It's easy too. Cause my backyard is like a humongous, massive tract of BLM. So I just walk out my door. It's very convenient. Yeah, you can't ride. Can you ride? Um, can you use your ATV on that BLM land? Is uh, that on on designated two tracks? You can, which there's so many out there. Um, uh-huh. But I just like to walk. I, I get into the more like uh, desolate areas and just walk. I'm a. I've used my vehicle, my my dog rig, to um, to me just put along and then run along the side. But I know this sounds really corny, but I don't know. I just like the spirit of walking around with them. I, I just it just feels good to just walk with them. I was so just I, talking I, generally. Generally, oh, yeah, you totally you know, can. Yeah, yeah, just you have to stay on a maintained road. I wasn't sure on BLM. Yeah, is it is it all vehicles or is it? Um, it's just vehicles, right? All vehicles are allowed as long as you're on the road. Yeah. Um, bicycles, horses, and pedestrian traffic is allowed cross pasture, which is just like the slang for off any road, pretty right. much. Yeah. Right. So. Yep. Yes. Well, uh, you know, the, the thing with dogs and training is if you're just consistent and do the same things and, and be consistent, you know, that's the biggest thing is, is super important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got a question. Yeah. My, my dogs definitely know when it's their exercise is just running around trying to catch each other playtime on the farm. Yeah. I'm sure Lauren, you, I know, you know, when you, when you're living with, how many hounds now? Four? Five. Four. Four. Do you still have the red tick? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. You got Piper. <laughs> Piper, Cedar, Ridge, and um Pabst, the red tick. What's what's in the dog's name? Pabst, like the beer. Pabst, okay. <laughs> I don't like it. That's what she came with. Um, and she knows it, so Yeah. 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 So I yep. feel like I'm Lord of the Flies right now. We're like in that weird time of fall year where the falls uh, flies all know that end is coming soon. There's like twenty. There's like twenty flies buzzing around up here in my attic. Ew, that sucks. Well, I had that like uh, a month ago, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The freeze has killed everything here. Luckily, that's I love it. It's so nice. Once the freeze hits here, what's a bug? <laughs> you don't see anything. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a happy place right now. All the scorpions and things died, which is great because they're everywhere in like every building. But once the once the frost hit, they all hunker down for the winter, which is really nice. We've had I several did kill freezes. a rattlesnake though. You mm-hmm. did? Yeah, I did. Uh, yesterday at work. Yep, it was right by one of our um, right by one of our horse barns. And like it, with a gun, with a shovel, no, with we, your bare, bare hands. Oh, um, I bit his head off. <laughs> Nothing big. <laughs> Now uh, a shovel, yeah, the old, the old classic. But it's pretty cool that we had a guy with us that has never killed a rattlesnake or like seen a rattlesnake like destroyed. Mm-hmm. And uh, I cut the head off and removed the head, and I grabbed onto the body with my hand, and the stump turned around and struck my arm. And I, and I told him it would do that, and he didn't believe me. So I just seized the body real quick, and it the stump struck my arm, which is so crazy. And like even the... without their head. <laughs> yeah. It's so gnarly. So many people get bit That's by decapitated crazy. snake. Yeah. And so I put the shovel up to its head that was decapitated. And uh, as the shovel is moving towards its decapitated head, you can see the eyes tracking the shovel. And then you put what? the shovel near its mouth and they'll bite the shovel. And you yeah. can see all the venom spray out on the shovel head, which blows people away that reptiles can survive for a long time without their body attached to their head because their oxygen demands are a lot lower. So it's <gasps> crazy. What? That yeah. is 
Oh my god, I didn't even I did not know that. That's crazy. See, their body can stay alive severed from their head for almost 30 minutes. It's like a turtle. So how do you how do you kill it? Kill it. You just can't. So, no. <laughs> what I do is I am um, I I cut the head off and oh. then I just pulverize the head with a shovel into like oh. bush so that it well, can't bite. And I got to let you guys go for a second. There's I, there's someone might be here. Hold on. You can keep talking. Yeah, yeah. Mutus. Mutus. There you go. Got rid of her. <laughs> yeah, anytime we're recording, anything moves, I just hear a cacophony of hounds going. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's the nice thing about mine. If we're not hunting, they're all asleep because they're lazy. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. But, well, hey, I got some follow-up stuff that I want to cover on. Uh, and one thing about the uh, uh, solo scent episode, I got a lot of really good reviews on that, and I appreciate everybody contacting me and stuff like that. But uh there were a couple thing, couple interesting questions that came in, and I really don't feel like, uh, I got to tell you, when you're sitting there and you're just trying to do a podcast and you're just looking at a mic, mm-hmm. it's pretty daggone tough. Mm-hmm. You're like monologuing <laughs> the whole way. Oh, yeah. I was yeah. thinking about that while you were recording that. I was like, I, I would have had a big bullet, big bullet like uh, chart out in front of me. That's the only way I could have stayed even remotely on task. It was horrible. I said, okay, and... You know, it, it, several several things I need to do to polish my m- monologuing, my solo performance on a podcast, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> well, I liked it. I thought you did a good job. Well, I appreciate it. But um, anyway, I, I want to talk about barometric pressure a little bit. And uh, I got a really good question asking about barometric pressure and what that does to scenting and stuff like that. And it was uh, basically... You know, does barometric pressure affect scent as well? And um, one of the things that do you know? Do you have any experience with barometric pressure? Well, so I just know that, like when you're when you're stalking deer on low pressure systems, it's harder to get a little closer to them if the wind isn't perfect. Um, I don't want to spoil anything or say any false knowledge, so. But I do know that high pressure systems are easier to get close to air scenting animals. Um, well, but, I, I thought we'd just talk about what barometric pressure is a little bit. Oh, just, sure, sure. You know, so barometric pressure is me- measured by uh, a column of air above the point where you're measuring it. So, and it goes all the way up through the atmosphere and how much mm-hmm. down pressure there is on the measuring device at that particular point. Uh, so you've got this this column of air that that is goes all the way up through the Earth's atmosphere, and then your barometer measures what the pressure is of that individual column of air. Right. And so, when we're talking about scent and how barometric pressure affects that, just like you said, a low pressure day, the scent is held closer to the earth. Uh, if you look at smoke ch- chimneys, chimneys and smoke coming out of chimneys on low pressure days, then the smoke will hang close to the earth. You know, it, it lingers through valleys mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. on high pressure days, it goes straight up into the atmosphere. And so high pressure days are great days to like sit in tree stands and things like that because your scent, a human scent is, is plumed up into the sky and then it's rising rapidly and then the air carries it away. Whereas a low pressure day, you know, if you're, especially if you're in a tree stand and this is a, maybe a, a broad under a little easier for us to wrap our mind around this, you know, your, your scent is pluming up, but the low pressure is pushing it back down. So it's going to go back down to where a deer can smell it. So with mm-hmm. scent, it's a, it's a microscopic organism that's released from the body. So barometric pressure absolutely affects a dog's ability to scent. So as an animal moves across the landscape and the scent is coming off the animal, if there isn't enough barometric pressure, it can actually go pretty high up into the the atmosphere. But we talked about micrometeorology in that podcast. So you've got all those air currents that exist from ground level all the way up to six feet. So for a dog, even if the scent goes up six feet off the ground, then that's unavailable to his nose to... Uh, What's that message say? I haven't got my glasses on. 
Oh, she said she's back. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So, so on a high pressure day, you know, the scent, even if it's, even if it's three feet above the ground and it's, it's plumed up there and it's, it's rising, it's going to be hard for the dog to yep. have access to it. That's and what that's it really thing. is. Access. And, you know, the low pressure systems, just on a side note too, the low pressure systems are typically when there's a storm or a cloudy, cloudy days yep. around cooler temperatures, typically. Mm-hmm. I think that's a, an I N H G stands for inches of mercury to those who did not know, which I did not know that for a lot longer in my life than I'd like to admit. <laughs> so, yeah. The, well, the, I didn't know that at all ever. So it's a really weird old way of measuring the barometric pressure of the atmosphere. And, uh, it's still used in America today, which is what I use too. It's what I know. But when you see that barometer dropping, you know, us cool waves coming in and maybe some rain, hopefully, you know, at least here. Did you guys get any questions about scent or tracking or did you have any after that? Cause I, I do want to build on that in the future. I think it's uh, something that's very important to houndsmen and understanding how scent works. I just wanted to interject and put in there that, um, like biologically speaking, the best way to describe how a dog uses its nose to interpret the world is that a human's eyesight is only about 30% dedicated to their, their brain power is only 30% dedicated to their eyes roughly, Mm -hmm. but a dog's brain is over 70% dedicated to their sense of smell. So they interpret their entire existence through that nose from a Pinkanese to a hound. And so I just always think that's incredible. They even tell time by the smell of the world which is amazing. So based on the levels of ozone in the air and the chemistry changes of plants transpiring, they learn the way that time of the day smells in correlation with the sun position over the course of their life. They learn how to tell time based on the way the world smells. They, the way you were saying, Chris, how like emotions can be tied to scent. Mm -hmm. They learn to tie those cues of daylight into the way the world smells at that time. Yep. which I think is incredible. It's like you got this how ho- you got this dog that you think is at your house every day when you leave for work. And as soon as you leave, they go on this big tour through the countryside and visit all the neighbors, but <laughs> they're home when you get there. Because how do they know. <laughs> they know because hey, it's time for how do they yeah, they don't, it's not like they're wearing a wristwatch. Exactly. They go they learn through observation when you get home typically, and then they correlate the way the world smells at that point, and then they'll learn ahead of time by planning that when the world starts to smell like this, I should head home because master will be home at that time, and they just quickly associate those two scents, and that's how they tell time, and then they get home, and there they are when you get home. Yep. It's pretty amazing. They're a lot smarter than people think they are. Yeah. And that also says something about when they're really using their, their nose, that's why their ears turn off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's interesting. That's an interesting point. Yeah, so I another question I got was what is the easiest way to like if you're going to log things, what's the easiest way to record temperature and humidity? And so when we were canine handlers, we actually carried a thermometer that also measured the the uh, humidity is real is pretty cheesy really i mean it had a little flip back on it It was probably it's about the size of a playing card and uh, as long as you're using the same one every time and and you know that it's fairly accurate which you can you can check your phone and look at temperatures and humidities too so everybody's got at least an iphone you can on the weather app if you use weather bug that's one way but those little thermometers and stuff are are super cheap and I, I found them at um, uh, the farm and fleet store the other day with rain gauges and stuff like that. They had a little, they had a little deal there. It was like nine bucks and it's just a battery operated deal. So that's another thing that guys can have in their, in their uh, little war they chest there. Small enough to carry like in your hunting vest mm-hmm. or. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, portable weather stations. You can or like little weather monitors. You can carry. I used to carry one when I was big game hunting. Yeah, yeah. I just thought that was a cheap and easy. That's what we used. We didn't have anything fancy. It was just a a thermometer and a and a humidity gauge. So it's mm-hmm. awesome. That's such a that was a great. I mean, I obviously I like data and I like to nerd out, but I think that's an excellent way to kind of 
be consistent as like a, I always think about it in the terms of muzzle loading, you know, because you have to have the details down pat and to be consistent. And so if you're thinking about how your dog's nose is interpreting the world, you're going to only get better as a houndsman. So that, yeah, it was a good let's, one. Not let's... a lot of people came to me for scent questions because <laughs> nobody uses scent in my world, unfortunately. Right. I, I don't really get anything. <clears throat> the uh, sidetrack on muzzleloaders a little bit, you know, and, and going back to data, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and this is a very, very well-known podcast. And uh, with a very well-known host, and they were talking about muzzleloaders. And the host said that he felt like that the uh, the frontiersmen like Boone and Simon Kenton and those guys didn't use powder measures. That they just knew, like, knowing how much salt to put on an egg. No. <laughs> that's never the case they had pre-measured antler cups or pre-measured units somehow and that's how they did it yeah. sure i mean yeah you don't guess when you're holding a bomb maybe right. if you were in like very dire circumstances where you had to reload extremely quickly but yeah that's yeah there's that's really funny actually documentation <laughs> you know of of accoutrements that the frontiersmen carried and they carried powder measure either made out of antler tips yep. or um, brass. So both mm -hmm. are historically accurate. I just thought that was comical. That, that is funny. Yeah. So now there is also documentation of Simon Kenton. Most frontiersmen could load while they were running. You know, that's crazy. Dang. Yeah. That so, is. What era is that, though? Like, what year is that? Because I could see you reloading, like, a half-stock Hawking rifle running, which would be tough, but you could do it. But, like, one of those big, long rifles, like seven, what our flintlocks? 1770s. Oh, that's beast level. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. I'm sure he yep. wasn't taking a whole lot of time to measure powder at that point because no, he, that's if he was loading and running, somebody was chasing him. <laughs> right. I was going to say, in dire circumstances, you would just guesstimate. But, yeah, yeah. that's... That's pretty badass. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. my pack's going crazy back here. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about... Uh, oh, I want to talk about one more question I had. And this question just came in today. I thought it was... I want to get your opinion on it, see what you guys think. So, an, uh, a young, young houndsman contacted me and said that he's got a uh, young dog that's approximately one year old. And um, he has been hunting this dog. But all of a sudden, the dog stopped hunting, and uh, it doesn't like it. It won't hunt with with the people that he's been hunting with. And what else were his things? Sometimes when he hunts it by himself, it'll only uh, go out about eighty yards and just kind of hang out and not really, really hunt. So just that broad base question. I want to get your guys' opinion on it and see what see what your thoughts were. Um, so is, is he asking, what can I do to change this? Or can he break this cycle? Or He just wants his dog to I hunt. Mean, yeah. wants, wants to know how to fix it. Um, so you say most of the time it just hangs out at like 80 yards? Or... Yeah, sometimes it just hangs out at his feet. Okay. I actually called him and talked to him about it. Hmm. You got any ideas, Lauren? You want me to go first? Well, I want to know how socialized that dog is. First of all, if it doesn't want to hunt with other dogs and did something bad happen, let's Definitely. say he got chewed off a tree. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's kind of my thinking because maybe he thinks, okay, if I go out into the woods, those other dogs are going to be there. Mm -hmm. Seth, what so, do you think? Go ahead, Lauren. Well, I would be... I'd be digging through the past trying to think of any details of maybe what happened. I'd be thinking exactly like Lauren said, was there a negative experience that happened or was there some kind of triggering event? And I would try to find all that. If nothing, none of that is obvious, then I would probably give the dog a little bit of time and then I would start trying to re-excite the animal gradually through like positive training methods, you know, however that species and that you're hunting is required to do that. And I would try to like build up that dog's confidence again if I think I could. I mean, it, I just, it's, it's, it's really hard. Scratching your head on what happened would be the toughest part for me. I try to figure out 
what happened so I can not repeat that if it's not just an anomaly to that dog and uh, try to just move on from there. If it once hunted, it will hunt again. Mm-hmm. It may just need some well, some training should. and some... Yeah. And, and maybe you you get it with a different dog that's different than all these other ones, socialize them together, you know, maybe have them in the house together, whatever it is, for like a couple weeks, and that dog's confidence will be up to be with that dog, and if that dog's a good hunter, that other dog will follow. Mm-hmm. Perhaps. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If it's if it's a negative experience type of thing, right? I would try to figure out that trigger point and then evolve my strategy from there. But that's all. That's crucial. Did he say, or he had no idea? Well, this is the first thing I told him he needed to do was have the dog dog checked for tick borne disease or lichia, uh-huh. um, because at that point when they contract or lichia, they're running a fever. He may just not feel like hunting. So let's let's start there and decide whether or not the dog's sick or not and get him healthy. The other thing, the dog is, the, the young hound is only a year old. So I asked him how often he was hunting the hound with with other people and by itself. And he's hunting that, that young hound about five nights a week. So a lot. Yeah. yeah. So my next thing is just like you said seth you know what experiences he had are you hunting him on coon or are you hunting him on bear if you're coon hunting do you have bear in the area uh because a lot of times not every not every hound is a bear dog and that can be a pretty frightening frightening experience if if a dog's not hardwired and has that prey drive so uh, again like you said was it a bad experience not only from other dogs but did he have an encounter with coyotes wolves you know whatever and and uh, he hadn't really hadn't really thought about that a lot but uh he doesn't believe that was the case so this is what i told him having having vet checked and then if he's got her lick you put him on doxycycline and and run him a full cycle of doxycycline and get him cleaned up and get him healthy again while he's doing that just put the dog up it, there mm-hmm. is nothing wrong with putting a hound up for a couple of weeks and build that desire in them you still get them out you still exercise them and stuff like that but you don't take them honey just lay them up and then as you reintroduce that dog to honey you try to put them in positive situations and if you need to go get a buddy's dog and bring him over to your house and tie him out next to him or put him in the kennel together or, or whatever you got to do to socialize him, a good dog, a dog that you can trust, a dog that he should go with, socialize him like you said, Lauren. And and then when you go out to hunt, you turn him loose. And if your dog doesn't hunt, you pick him up and you put him back in the box. And don't let him go. You know, he doesn't get, this isn't lollygagging time for that young hound. He's either going to go hunting or he's going to sit in the box and he's going to listen to the rest of it. Because uh, I even touched on this a little bit in, in my podcast about dogs' ability to watch and learn uh, in the scent podcast. And I didn't go into detail about it, but a lot of bird dog trainers and stuff will have a long gang line out there. And as they're working each dog, dog, the other dogs will sit on the gang line and watch them do retrieves and do whistle commands and do different things like that. And I've done the same thing with hounds. Um, time to the to the tailgate uh, while while you walk away. You know the, he hears the other dog treat in there. He knows what's going on there, and he knows that he's not going. Mm-hmm. So if he doesn't want to hunt, you put him back in the kennel. But I think. At some point, you know, people have to make a decision how much time they're going to put into these things. But I think a lot of times houndsmen make general, not houndsmen, houndsmen don't make general statements. They look at dogs and they know each one's an individual and they try to diagnose individual problems and they don't take shotgun approaches to things. Mm -hmm. Uh, Good trainers don't. So, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, that's where I'm at. I was going to interject and just say that uh, observational learning is massive in my world. That's that's how they learn 90% of what they need to learn is by watching their elders who are really experienced. Because when you're out there on a really vague area like the prairie, 
um, they, there's only sight as the only way really to find one. So they, they just watch their elders, how they, they fan out and comb over the prairie and they copy each other. And uh, yeah, I was just going to say that that's an excellent way for dogs to learn. They just learn by watching and uh, yeah, going with their elders and picking that up. I think that's really an important way. It's a crucial for me, definitely. Yeah. That's, that's kind of where I'm at with this little English dog that I picked up. Um, you know, is she going to hunt or is she not going to hunt? And I've got to figure that out. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, it's, it's, it's been an interesting ride and, um, I don't have all the resources I need right now. And it's, it's kind of frustrating. Um, I need to catch a coon and I just can't right now. And I need to go run in some different woods and I can't right now because of deer season. Mm. and and the and the yeah. covids and the covids yeah, yeah. all the covids <laughs> That's right. um so yeah and i'm just like okay i don't think she has the prey drive that i need a dog to have you know just comparing her to the rest of my pack it's just totally different um so i was like okay i got some deer legs and i'm like well maybe i can train her to track a deer mm-hmm so this is just all some thinking I've got. And, you know, if she doesn't work out, then she doesn't work out and I'll find her a pet home. Mm-hmm. And it mm-hmm. is what it is. And I start again with a actual puppy. Indeed. Yeah. I, um, you know, it's funny what, what, when you make that call, every houndsman is going to be different, but when you make that call for what dog is going to work for you or not, that is a tough bridge that I haven't had to cross yet. And so, but that is something, you know, when you were going circling back to, that young houndsman with his problem of that pup, you know, when do you say enough is enough? And that line is actually quite subjective for people because I've seen guys with coyote coursing dogs that wouldn't engage with a coyote for five years. And then one day they just boink started. And I know people that are like, I would have never put up with a hound for that long. Right. And then it turned out to be a really good dog at six years old. But, you know, I just think that's a, an interesting question to raise with, with fellow houndsmen when I'm talking around the campfire is just like, when do you pull the plug? And you're just like, all right, I've tried my best. I've worked with this dog. It's time to find it a good pet home. You know? Yeah. And I've I don't... done that once before and it was hard. Very mm-hmm. hard. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had to do that, Chris? I've never found him a pet home. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but, but you know, Calling is seems like a thing that it's a dirty word these days because uh, we don't we don't our society doesn't tolerate that. But when I talk about calling, calling could simply be neutering or spaying, taking them out well, of the gene pool, and then that's what I did. Yeah. So it, no, it, and I. I this drives me crazy when I, when I, I've known guys that didn't have the guts to call a dog. And when I say call in this, I'm talking about, um, the, the, our ancient breeders, our traditional breeders took dogs out of the gene pool permanently. Okay. Um, and I think I, th- German breeders got where they were because they weren't afraid to call dogs. Uh, so I'm I'm not I'm trying to tap dance around a pretty sensitive issue because um, of the cultural acceptance and calling is something that that is not going to be tolerated on a wide scale in our society. When mm-hmm. I'm talking, you know, killing a dog. Right. Yeah, and right. and at the same time, there are people who would take cold dogs and then breed them just to make money or, you know, just because. So there's a reason to call a dog, whether that be death or spaying, right. neutering. Mm-hmm. Right. I do think it's a responsible move either way that if you're going to call a dog and give it away, you should probably neuter it first for two reasons. One to make sure that it isn't perpetuated and two, to make sure that it's more um, palatable for the pet home area. I guess I don't want to say the pet home market, but like 
people are more uh, uh, for a pet an altered animal is more desirable than an unneutered or unspayed dog. And so I think that's, I think it's kind of imperative to the houndsman to make sure that you spay or neuter that dog before you want to call it either way. You know what I mean? Unless you know, you're when we talk disposing about, of it. Yeah. When you talk about calling, you talk the, about, hu- you know, how humane is it to, to <clears throat> put a dog down, have it put down and, and call mm-hmm. it when I'm talking about this ass, this, this part of calling. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you take, say you decide that, you know, I just don't want to do that. And you've got this wigged out pup that, or a young dog that, you know, is not going to work for you. Maybe it's got some, you know, genetic flaws or whatever. And you think you're going to neuter the dog and then give it away to a pet home. And when it gets to the pet home, it's still a wigged out little dog that's going to chew stuff up it's going to run around the house you know most of these dogs need a job of some kind and we can look around society and sit in any vet's office and see the people with the the fat lab that comes in that's obese um, and they're going to be overfed they're going to be bored they're going to be destructive and eventually, it's not going to be a humane life for them anyway, because they're going to be given away. They're going to go to the pound. They're going to, you know, they're going to drop them off. They're going to be euthanized there. And maybe that's the word we need to use is euthanization. But there's always a flip side to it. You know, oh, euthanization is cruel. How could you do that just because a, a dog won't hunt? But if you've got a dog that's hardwired that needs a job, and then you try to put it in a pet home, that could be as equally cruel and a recipe for disaster as agreed not doing it you know not not euthanizing the dog yeah Yeah. and the one thing too is that i have a very high bar for behavioral stuff and if i have a dog that just will not hunt or uh with other animals because he's just inherently aggressive it's something that i can't work out and there i'm gonna euthanize that dog i'm not gonna put it in a pet home and i'm not gonna deal with that I need dogs that hunt as a team and together. And it's very rare in the sighthound world to have a dog that's really aggressive, but that's a line I'll never cross. Um, that that's a that's a um, that's a huge red flag for me. And I think um, it, it's something that's really important to the breed as a whole, anyway. And I mean, you know, I definitely agree with you in that um, it, it really is. A, it's it's up to the individual houndsman, and and it's also up to the houndsman community as a whole. Because if you have a dog that is have a wonderful personality and it is like whatever a, a, would be an ideal pet, then I think sure it's definitely yeah. And I know you're not arguing for that at all. Yep. Um, I, I just mean that yeah. If you have a basket case or just a dog that yeah, I mean it's a line that I'm sure all houndsmen have thought about many many times, and it's a tough question, and uh, it's definitely something that requires a lot of thought and. It's a tough topic to discuss. Yes, very tough. Very tough. Very I think tough. I was in a special situation when I decided to to rehome one of my dogs because I did get her fixed and then I had trained her. Like house trained, yard trained, manners trained, all that stuff. So I put so much work into this dog that you know, she deserved to go where she where she's at now. Right. But not all dogs have that. Mm-hmm. I've just seen so, a lot of I've just but, seen a lot of adopted hound breeds uh, that show up or or they come from the pound and and once they get home, people realize they can't keep them in the house because they're too high energy. So they leave them outside and then they terrorize the neighborhood, running deer and and then it makes for a bad neighbor and. Um, then your neighbors your neighbors don't tolerate it and it could meet an untimely death or a cruel death that way as well that happened all the time where i grew up all the time yeah Yeah. loose like hunting and herding breeds that were just terrorizing the whole area Yeah. yeah and i totally agree with you i mean people get dogs that are not well suited for pet life and you just shake your head People need to know what they're getting into, whatever breed they get. And if they get a mixed bag of But nobody does. Mutt, it's emotions. No, no, they don't. And that's no, the problem. Don't. Like the, the, the extreme like dog rescue community is just like, oh, it's how you raise them. It's how you raise them. And I'm like, mm, yeah, no. Nah. Like there's a lot of genetic factors. Obviously, every houndsman knows that. But a lot of people are brainwashed into just thinking that a breed is just a shape and a size and a characteristic of personality that's like pleasant and 
societally well, acceptable. Well, and that any dog can be a good dog. What's Which- yeah, I mean, <laughs> no, <that's, laughs> uh, it's subjective and true in a way, but in a way it's not, you know what I mean? Like I just, the, the pit bull community is really, um, really polarizing in that way because like people are like, Oh, it's all how you raise them. And other like parts of that community are like, no, like you need to understand this is like a powerful animal that can do a lot of damage quickly. And the way I always just like talk about it with people, cause I know a lot of people that are in like the hardcore, like rescue community. And I, I love to just talk to people, especially people that have like very differing views about things in me. And I'll just, I'll be like, they'll be like, yeah, the, the blue healers will like nip your heels cause they're herding dogs. And I'm like, so you don't think like a powerful animal that's been bred for centuries to lock on to other animals is going to be not more predisposed for violence than like a golden retriever. You know what I mean? Like those genetics are there. And so it's a lot easier to take a pit and train it to lock onto a pig than it is a pinkanese or like a poodle. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> those genetics are there and they matter and it's going to inf- in, like infer how that animal matures and views the world. And so, yeah, I just think you that you can't you're blame genetics right. on one dog and not another. Right. Well, of course. And I mean, look at, look at the differences between us three, you know, we're all the same species and I mean, yeah. Homeo there's a lot sapiens. Of variance. Yeah. There's a lot of, yes. <laughs> There's a lot of variance in uh, in and just the personality of a breed, sure, but there's still characteristics that have been selected for a lot more intensely than in people. You know what I mean? So, right. I guess my mo- my point is moot. But anyway, yeah. So I agree with you, Chris, and, one, and that one, is a very difficult topic to dance around. One thing that I've found that sometimes a hound um, simply just needs a change of address. You know, <laughs> I've had some hounds that I knew that me and this hound were never going to get along. There was something about them, you know, a personality difference, something that I didn't, that, that wasn't going to be acceptable for me. And so by, but there were, there were traits in that dog that didn't make it, a you know, something that needed to be taken out of the gene pool. You know, it had, mm-hmm. it had some, some raw talent and, and maybe some really good talent, but there's just something about it that I didn't like, you know, mm-hmm. um, maybe it was attitude, maybe it's a little bit of shyness, but it was a game catching, game catching fool. Um, I have one plot female one time that could absolutely scorch a track. I mean, just absolutely light it up. She would just run away and leave <clears throat> other hounds if she was turned loose with another hound, but once it got to the tree, it was over. There was nothing there and did everything with that dog. So I just on a whim decided to go on a, a a deer hunting forum, a deer dogging forum and ask somebody if they were interested in this hound. And it's like, yeah, I'll try her. She went out there and she's a deer hound in, in Mississippi and they love her. So there's always, there's a lot of times there are options. Mm -hmm. That's a great, that's a great point. Seriously. Cause like I could have a personality that makes me a better chess player than I am a badminton player. You know what I mean? But I could be, yeah, that's a, that's a great way to look at it. Badminton. Fantastic. We've talked about, are we, we've talked about badminton in the past. We got to come up with the best games ever. (laughs) <laughs> like <laughs> badminton's awesome. It's a gentleman's game. You can look classy playing badminton, but it's oh also yeah, super you can <laughs> look classy look playing badminton. Sure, you can. That's like a that's like a that's a that's a sport of like the gentleman. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh huh. That's not what I was taught in gym class, and we even had a written exam on badminton, and it did not say is this the sport of the gentleman or the gentlewoman. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. But. Um, so you were talking about something, Seth, and I think it'll be a good segue into our next topic. But uh, you were talking about the genetics and the canine's ability to watch and learn. And you were talking about the out on the range. Were you talking about your sidehounds or were you talking about oh, like the wild, wild dogs canine? in general? But I was both, but mostly with the sidehounds. They, they're really a hardcore observational learner, not because they're sidehounds. It's just because that style of hunting – is all about observation. You know, so. when you when you think about sidehounds, it amazes me because we already know it, that, you know, 70 plus percent of a dog's brain is dedicated to smell 
and not mm-hmm. a lot of sight there. So, you know, how do they overcome that to be side hounds? I think about that all the time. That would be like humans being like hearing hunters. Like if, if like you blindfolded us and you hunted by your hearing, like pick a sense of that or, or and vice versa. Or, s- or uh, smell. smelling. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like you decided to like, okay, humans, the best way is to smell and look, but they actually do through selective breeding. They actually do have a more concentrated amount of rod cells in their visual streak. So I'm going to not make it super nerdy, but I'm going to break this down a little bit. So when a mammal that all of us, uh, yeah, we got something. that. That's like third yeah. grade biology. <laughs> yeah. So you have cone <laughs> cells and you have rod cells in your eyes. Cone cells pick up uh, color, so three chrome, and they allow you to see color better. And rod cells allow, uh, they're more sensitive to movement and light, but they can only perceive two chrome. So rod cells are what lots of animals that are um, very um, perceptive at night have, and they have very few cone cells. And uh, animals that have mammals that have good color vision have a lot more cone cells and less rod cells. And so uh, dogs have a lot of rod cells in their eyes. Most mammals do. And so they're concentrated in the middle of the retina where the animal is looking for movement more. So sight hounds have more of these rod cells clustered around their visual streak to help them exactly do what they're supposed to do, which is pick up on any slight movement. And it obviously it goes straight to the motor cortex where they're going to take off running. So they're really, we have selected for a dog that's better at detecting minute movement and immediately giving chase mm-hmm. than something that isn't, which I think is crazy. And one thought, one, uh, one experiment all the listeners can do, and I'm sure many of us have noticed this throughout their life, but if it's dark outside and maybe there's a faint amount of moonlight, look at something directly and it's really dark. But if you look away and you look through your peripheral vision, it's a lot brighter and you can actually see it easier. And the reason is is because humans have large amounts of cone cells concentrated in the middle of their retina so that we have incredible color vision, but we have more rod cells dispersed on the outside of our visual streak. And so when you look away and look at something through your peripheral vision, you actually can see better at night that way. So something Well, and I think in general in our peripherals, we notice movement. Like if you're out hunting and you're in a tree stand or something and you like see a little movement out on the left side of you, like, oh, and you look and you're like, oh, darn squirrel. (laughs) Yeah, I surely could be. Humans have a lot of incredible adaptations for hunting that a lot of people overlook. And anthropology is really a cool field. But yeah. So so a side hound, a side hound has been genetically bred for those rod cells compared to my sin hound. Correct. They have more. Uh, they actually. So dogs have pretty poor vision in general. They usually go blurry after about 200 yards. Mm-hmm. And so um, they have since they have more rod cells com- compressed closer to the visual streak. It doesn't mean that they can see farther than normal dogs. It just means that they're much more acute at picking up movement and they are more sharp at staying on some an object moving and they have improved depth perception than mm-hmm. a normal dog does. And it's not because of the rod cells. It's actually because of the shape of their skull. They have a better overlapping field of view because they have a really skinny head. Mm-hmm. And so that allows their – so that's how depth perception is perceived is that how much of your eyes – how much of your vision overlaps with each other in front of your face. And sight hounds have a lot more of that than other breeds do. They also have a much wider field of view. They can see a much wider degree of vision around their heads than a normal dog can, especially I- – Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say I had a one-eyed dog one time that that had uh, you could tell the difference, you know, no depth perception. When they come up mm-hmm. to a creek bank, they would they would hesitate for just a second, mm-hmm. you know, where another dog would run up to the creek bank and just squirrel and bail off and keep going. They would get to the edge and they just a little hesitant step there, just for them to orient themselves before they they cross through. Mm-hmm. And That's humans are the same way. If you get a one-eyed person, or if you, you know, your depth perception goes way down when you're only using one eye. Yeah, and the thing is, is that we take a lot of our physical abilities for granted, or for not. Like humans are always like, oh, we're so bad at everything, but um, we actually have amazing vision and incredible depth perception. Some of the best in the animal kingdom. Mm-hmm. So don't take our eyes for granted. We rock at seeing. <laughs> Yeah. So we have incredible depth perception, incredible um, reactivity to movement, and obviously some of the best color vision in the animal kingdom, besides birds and other kinds of cephalopods, like uh, squids and stuff. Yeah, and there's people like me who are legally blind and need Coke bottle glasses. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, we're what, lucky we're smart enough to invent those. What yep. happens what happens if if you don't have your glasses on? Um, well, so in high school I actually swam without glasses or contacts because if you dove in and your goggles popped off, like, whoop, there go your contacts too. Right. Mm. So, it I had to count how many strokes into the to the wall for you to turn around. Um, where other people could could see, you know, 10 feet ahead or whatever it is when they're swimming. I would sometimes come up too short or too long on the wall, but when I don't have my glasses, it's rare. So I I just move a lot slower. And when she puts them on, Chris, you get a lot uglier. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like uh, I didn't know. You know, I didn't know if it was like a a Superman type thing where when you take your oh. glasses off. But, uh, you know, I wish I turned into some kind of superhuman, but, you know, I'm still always clumsy in the woods no matter what, if I've got them <laughs> on or off. <laughs> well, we were actually, I was actually getting to the, the watching and learning type thing a little bit here, and it was going to segue into our next topic, and that's the delisting of the gray wolf. And the reason the sight thing came to mind was because, like Dr. Uvarius Geist, have you heard of him? Mm-hmm. Lauren, have you ever heard of this guy? No. You need to find Dr. Uvarius Geist and listen to I him. I think I think you've mentioned I've, yeah. the, the name rings a bell, but I, I don't know anything. Yeah, Dr. Geist uh, is an expert on predator, predator pits, uh, a, a great mind. He was actually one of the people that uh, wrote and created the uh, North American model for wildlife conservation an authority on, on uh, wildlife issues in North America for sure. But he, he actually was doing this speech that, that I was listening to. I've never met him or seen him in person, but he was talking about the ability of the wolf. He raised a wolf and the wolf learned how to manipulate the gate latch just simply by watching him. That's how acute he was, the wolf is, to visual learning. Mm. And like the the natural wolf will sit on the, the young, will sit on the ridge and watch the rest of the pack hunt. Uh, they don't stay in the den all the time and, and wait for the food to come back. They go out, but they'll sit on a ridge and watch the rest of the pack hunt, and that's how they learn. I thought that was wow. pretty, pretty interesting. but They're incredible at that. Um, and it's been shown through like empirical evidence that ethology is the study of animal behavior. And uh, Stanley Corin is like a really famous dog ethologist. He, in his book, The Genius of Dogs, he talks about that exactly, how wolves are superior um, observational learners to dogs and the parts of their brain that cause that kind of independent learning is greatly diminished in dogs mm -hmm. so, because that's not important to the for us. We We teach them and they learn by asking... Dog, it was more advantageous for dogs to survive by asking for humans for help. And so, like, when you give them problem solving, when you give them th uh, problems that require, like, observational learning and problem solving, wolves are much better at it than dogs are. Mm -hmm. But dogs are just a lot better at being like, hey, come over here and help me because I look cute and you're my friend. And then human does it for him. <laughs> so it's a pretty great book. I, I devoured it. But, yeah, really interesting stuff how different dogs and wolves are how much we've manipulated their brain. But that's why you tie a young dog back at a tree. That's why I do. I tie him back at a tree. If, I've, if I'm hunting a young dog and maybe they're not treeing as well as I think they should, you know, I'm, I'm trying to bring that instinct. There's a couple reasons I want to get that desire for him to start treeing. And, and, but I'll tie the young dog back and then with the older dog, I'll go up there and I'll get down on my knee and sit there and pet the dog and, and really – reward that dog visually physically uh, and vocally until that pup understands that when he's there he's going to get the same treatment and i've actually tied old dogs back and then led the young dog up and they get up on the tree and as soon as i go down to a knee they start they start treeing you know they'll start barking at mm. the tree that's awesome that's awesome <laughs> jinx what's that we we said that it's awesome at the same time, and I laughed and I said, "Ha ha, jinx!" To <laughs> Seth. <laughs> well, One thing I pick... really love about talking about this kind of stuff is that the, I love dog training, and my particular 
uh, style of hunting requires a lot less training than you guys. And so I love to just sit back and listen to how you guys work and handle and train hounds because it's so different than my world. I mean, like I interviewed David Heiss in one of the episodes that we posted and, uh, that's why he still hunts with sight hounds in his eighties is that it's a lot simpler. I just make sure they come when I call them. And then I say, get them <laughs> when something comes up <laughs> yeah. and it's that simple, you know, it's that easy. And they the rest of it is just instinct. Exactly. Just and genetics technique. and instinct and technique, which they learn over their life. But yeah, genetics and instinct. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, we quote unquote train with our dogs or train our dogs, but a lot of it just comes with time. Oh yeah. You know, and you just emphasize certain things and or pay attention to certain things a little bit more. You know, with the scent hound versus the sight hound, but over time if you've got a well-bred dog that has it in them to do something, they're going to do it. Mm. There's a lot it, more of a puzzle to put together too for you guys because for my prey it's in sight. Like they can literally see it. So they're going to push it really hard and they're going to, you know, see it. And and there's more of that like puzzle to put together for your area because they can't see it. They have to hunt by their nose and it, it, it may take a different, it obviously takes a yeah. different skill set. And then and, we have to decide like, Oh, well this happened. Well, why did this happen? Yeah. With, and for with me, you it's, guys, you're like, Oh, well the dogs got outrun. You know, they, yeah. they didn't corner when they should have cornered, whatever it was. There's a lot of technique, a lot more than I thought there ever would be um, in, in, a, in a really well-orchestrated rabbit hunting pack, a hair coursing pack. But even still, it's just not as nitty gritty. And I love listening to how you guys work with those scent hounds. I think it's really interesting. And, and uh, when this COVID nightmare ends, I'm coming up to hunt with you guys. Cool. Well, I'm going to a- have to give that, that uh, trick a try, though, by tying, tying a dog up if I've got that issue. That sounds like I'm at Lauren's house. <laughs> I think somebody just pulled in, and my my guard dog Pitbull uh, alerted alerted me that there's someone here. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of parts of that puzzle that have to come together, you know. And and man, we we really should drill down into that sometime and talk about all the parts that have to come together, you know, from imprint training when they're young to introducing them to the right game, to, you know, trash breaking, to, you know, all the different parts that go into, you know, getting a dog to tree is a lot, 90% genetic, you know. Um, But there are some things that you can kind of put things in your favor to to speed up the process. But I think the biggest thing is just patience. And we we get so... We read things on the internet about the four month old wonder pup that's doing everything, and then people can't figure out why they don't have a dog like that, and they get discouraged too easy. Yeah, and that's another thing, too, is when I first started, at least patience on a pup, that's a big one. And there's a lot of hocus pocus stories on the internet. <laughs> yes. Too. I learned a lot about patience in the last year, guys. I'm telling you. <laughs> what? These dogs just. Well, no, I'm just saying, like, these are now the second puppies I've raised, and they just turned a year old. So uh-huh. I just, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. I got put through the ringer. Well, you you bit off a, a you know, a lot there because you yeah. took two pups at once. That's and, yeah. And uh, it's hard to, to raise and train one, and without a lot of experience, it's it's really hard to raise and train too yeah and and uh, you know and maybe i'm not doing it all right either um but i'm i'm trying and i i think i could have started both of them on bear but kind of now i'm happy that i got to dedicate time and everything to one dog doing that and then ridge doing raccoon and you know kind of split it up that way um, and I'll, I'll tell you, I, I got Piper when Piper was a puppy, I took her and her sister home and those were, that was the first puppy I ever had in my life. And, uh, two weeks later I was like, I can't do it. Gave her sister back. <laughs> um, but the second time around I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with it. Um, you know, I had the farm then at that point when I brought him home. So there was just a little more 
you know, I could have them run around and stuff like that. Right. They had the, the milk house to be in if I was getting sick of them. Um, well, let's yeah. uh, let's shift gears and, and move over to the wolf thing. We almost got there a minute ago, and then I think I'll, I'll say I sidetracked it because I started talking about sight hounds and, and, or sight learning and things like that. But uh, So the gray wolf was delisted. Um, it's mm-hmm. been about four weeks ago now. I can't. I don't have yep. the exact date. I don't have. The, I mean, I can bring it up. I don't have the date either. But there is like a sixty-day waiting period, and I think is it um, like January fourth or something that it would officially go into effect. Don't quote me on the date. I got to look. Okay. Why don't you look that up? And yep. And so, I know that while you're looking that up, you know, there's a lot of a lot of traffic on the internet about it, a lot of traffic on social media about it. But um, the upper Midwest is kind of celebrating right now as far as having the option to do that. But I think that a little bit of conversation about the actual process of being able to start managing the gray wolf is in order so that people understand how the process and how agencies come to that decision. So um, I know they've been hunting them in the West for a number of years. And Seth, you've been involved with uh, a lot of these discussions and management plans and, and different things, or at least peripherally uh, heard, heard the, been, been involved in some of those conversations. So what's your experience? Well, my experience, and again, this is just – my uh, personal experience has been almost exclusively or exclusively with the um, New Mexico uh, wolf management pro- uh, strategy, I suppose, the with the Mexican gray wolf. Which has and not been delisted, by the way. It has not. And I was right. just going to say that it is in its own special category um, as a, in a non-essential experimental population. And it is still protected. Yes. Um, and so... But um, I can give my two cents as we kind of move along. I don't want to just kind of go into a deep monologue, but I do have um, I do have a lot of uh, thought put into this subject because uh, it, it does affect um, it does per- affect perception and um, administration and um, execution of big game hunting throughout the entire West and now entire United States. And it has a huge impact. This is one of the most pivotal, um, issues in, um, the outdoors right now. And so, um, obviously I've put a great deal of thought into it. So as we move through it, I'll definitely interject and and we'll kind of talk about my strategy. My, um, I will just say right up front, my, um, I I'm just a very, um, um, compromising individual in general. And I like to definitely look at issues from all sides and kind of conglomerate on what I think works for me. So I'm more than happy to kind of discuss this, but as far as the Mexican wolf goes, I did. Yeah. I wanted to in, interject and say that, um, this is definitely a, that one's its own unique little issue. And, and it is a great microcosm and metaphor for the in, incredibly difficult and complex situation that is wolf recovery in the un, United States. Yeah. And, so we've uh, got Colorado yeah. that just passed a referendum a voter referendum to reintroduce or to do an introduction of the gray wolf into Colorado. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the federal government that has delisted the, the Canadian gray wolf for lack of better understanding or better term, but that just because it's been delisted, the federal government has basically what's happened is they've kicked it back to state wildlife agencies and state government to regulate how the wolf is going to manage, be managed. So, and uh, January fourth is that date, twenty twenty one. So okay, I was um, correct what happens there. On, what happens on that date? At that date, then once the rule is in effect, then the states and tribal agencies resume responsibility for sustainable conservation of the Canadian gray wolf. Um, And I think when this all happened, the people that aren't educated on it and aren't, you know, into all the details that go around with it are like, Oh, well, wolves are just going to be hunted to extinction again. And they thought there's going to be some open season on it and blah, blah, blah. Well, no, (laughs) 
it doesn't work that way. Yeah. So what um, was the term you use? You said something about you use conservation. What was that? Uh, sustainable conservation. Sustainable conservation. So what people, we've allowed the media to, to define some of the words that we use. The conservation is one of those terms that absolutely got hijacked from the hunting public. I mean, the hunters oh, were the sure. or original conservationists in this country and in North America. We were the ones that were footing the bill for management, for habitat, for... We still know, are. Yeah, we still are. And But we've allowed that term to be hijacked. So when you see a talking head on the news and they say conservation organization, they could be talking about anything they don't know so, they could be talking about the you know the world wildlife fund as a conservation organization yeah so and the, the the whole thing about conservation sorry um i guess you can finish <laughs> no. <laughs> you roll I with it you can. roll with it i guess you can <laughs> roll with it i just it. had something in my head and i know Do, eventually don't I'll lose it. it go for it Okay, so the whole thing about conservation is, like you said, it's it's totally been a hijacked word. And I think so many people that aren't the hunters like us that aren't involved with it and pay our dues um, believe that conservation is basically saving everything instead of conservation of the species, conservation of the fa fauna, the flora, the habitat, everything that goes into it. It's just conserve everything, a.k.a. keep everything, let it all play out on its own, and disease runs rampant, and they don't understand that either. Um, because I've talked after this got, after this happened, and, you know, I post on Facebook or Snapchat and everything, like I had some of my friends coming out of the woodwork starting to argue with me about it, and they're like, well, top conservationists and blah, blah, blah are saying this is a bad idea and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let's stop here. Who are these conservationists you're talking about? Right, right. Seth, give us, a, give us the rundown on what conservation is because you're still actively working in that field. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the first thing I'm going to just say right now is that conservation is like – that word, like we were just talking about, is so broad. It's a huge umbrella term. But wildlife management is extremely complicated. And the most important thing that I want to say is that wildlife management is also mostly people management. So how you how we view wildlife, how we value wildlife, it has changed massively, obviously, throughout time. But conservation is not preservation. And that's something that's really important. Yes. Thank you there for you bringing that word up. There's so, a difference between, you know, if, if the news was going to report World Wildlife Fund is a preservation organization. They want to keep it all. Conservation is the wise management of wildlife popula populations and the habitat in which they, they live in. That is, that's conservation. And right. we, we get, we get sidetracked by those words. So, Getting back to the point is now the federal government has kicked that back to the state agencies and they've now the state, the state governments are going to have to come up with a management plan on, on for the, the wolf and places like Idaho and Montana, uh, Wyoming have already got wolf seasons. You know, they're, they're, they're managing the wolf population. Um, other states are going to have to figure out and have the authority now to establish management plans for that. So, uh, and, and they might ha be able to establish a plan, but it might not be time to put it in effect yet. Like, let's say some states, like, eventually we're going to need a season, but it's just not this year. Well, Maybe when, some states aren't yeah, the same as Wisconsin, and their population isn't quite there yet. Right. I'm going to interject real quick, if that's cool. I, I want to just say that the, as far as the delisting goes, typically, as far as wildlife management goes, I, I think it's usually best at the state level. So I'm going to say that overall, I think the delisting of the wolf was, for the most part, could have a positive connotation. Two, two things that's going to make it tough. One, I do not like when, you know, 
people attach way too much emotion to animals and a wolf is like the poster child for that problem. Yes. And, and so like when I'm when I'm talking about, you know, management plans for the banner tailed kangaroo rat, everyone's yawning, going to sleep and being like, I don't care. But, you know, <laughs> and that's good. That's what I want. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I just want people to be like, do whatever you want with those stupid rats. And like, they're really an important part of the ecosystem like a wolf is, but no one gives a crap about them. So nobody the, puts uh, an emotional value or an emotional attachment to a kangaroo rat. A kangaroo I rat. probably would once I meet one. Yeah, they're amazing. No. <laughs> anyway, so they're the bomb. So first of all, uh, that's a good thing and a bad thing. So the the some good things I can see peripherally from the delisting is that the problem, the issues, the problems, the issues, and the feelings of a wolf in Colorado are different than the values, problems, issues, and complexities of a wolf in Wyoming. So the good news is is that how people view the animal and how the animal is in the state is going to differ from state to state to state. And a blanket conservation call for an entire species usually is not the best call. And so, you know, New and Mexico. And also over time, like Colorado in 10 years might be different than Colorado now. R right. And so the, the problem, though, the problem is, is that when you switch the other direction, when you have very, very negative views of an animal in an area, there can be negative conservation choices made for that species as a whole. And that's the problem. So like this is where wildlife management gets extremely difficult and complicated because what is our goal? Is our goal to have wolves back or is our goal to have wolves at a culturally and politically acceptable level? And so when it comes down to the state management as long as you have competent biologists who are working in tandem with people, because I don't care what anyone says, and this is a tough pill to swallow for a lot of people, humans rule this world. And so we have to have wildlife management that is in sync with the cultural, political, and societal views of that animal. And so like, although I think wolves are an amazing animal and I think they do have a place in, in, on the landscape in North America, I hate to tell people that are pro, super pro-wolf that Sorry, wolves are not going to go back everywhere they once lived because okay, people that's live a thing. everywhere. Right. So, so there's so they're saying, you know, back to their, you know, whatever levels, their pre, you know, extinct levels. And I'm like, you know, humans impossible. have changed. Right. So I had this argument with uh, one of my friends and I'm like, humans have changed and how we inhabit the landscape and everything has changed from that point in in history so it's just you have to find that balance and i'm sorry to interject here too but when we talk about the delisting another thing that people need to know about or be educated about they're like oh well they're just being delisted you know what they're at that point where they can be number one and number two they need to know that that leaves a spot for an animal now that actually needs the protection yeah so you know like i said it's really complicated because there's pros and there's um, pros and cons to the the state management and like okay let's well what we are the con take... what are the cons to state management okay so this is gonna I'm gonna interject something here real quick go ahead these management plans are going to be made based on the wishes of the people in that state so the federal government has turned that power back to the state. For me, if Nevada doesn't want, if the people of Nevada don't want a wolf in Nevada, then the people of Nevada can decide that. I don't living in Indiana. You know, I should not be sitting in Indiana saying, well, people of Nevada ought to have wolves. If the people yeah. of Nevada don't want a wolf, that's their choice. And I, I, I respect that. Yeah. So I think federal blankets are, are typically a bad move with wildlife because it varies so much geographically when you have a huge, wide ranging animal like a gray wolf, which I totally agree. I'll get to a con. Um, here's major one. So uh, what is the goal of wildlife management in your area? Here, here's a con. Um, mountain lions. Let's use them as a stand in because they're the only large cat on the planet that's population is expanding. So you have a state like Texas that has open season on mountain lions. They're an undetected yes. animal. So mountain lion populations are super depressed there. And so if you look at a state like New Mexico that has like a robust man management program for mountain lions and like a lot of, um, a lot of uh, um, pro, pro mountain lion hunting 
policies that keep the population robust enough to sustain not only our game and ungulate populations, but also our um, mountain lion populations for recreational use in many different ways. The, it could be bad in that it, it doesn't help the species if that's the goal when you have a state that may be incredibly antagonistic towards that animal. And so I get what you're saying. Again, this is the overlap between humans and animals. I agree with you very much that if a state in general does not want this animal there, then if that's the will of the people, then they shan't be there. But mm -hmm. at the same time, sometimes people make a lot of wrong decisions. And sometimes an animal needs to be there for the entire system to be better. And a lot of people just don't know that. And so like this is this dip, this is the battle between science and data and cultural and human values and emotions. And the problem is, is that it's an incredibly difficult line to walk. I'm not advocating either, and I'm not saying that either is right or wrong. That's a personal choice for everyone at an individual level. But this is why science is hard. Yeah, <laughs> Wildlife it's, science is yeah, hard. Yeah, and it's, it's and gonna like be- Like you a, said, it's, it's a lot of people management too. Yeah, and so yes. like, do, do you want, do you, so let's, let's just It's take, gonna I'm be gonna, hard to convince a sheep farmer on the western slope of Colorado that the wolf needs to be there. Right. And the problem is and that's going to work as a problem for that community, the anti-wolf community, is that you have a large population of mostly incredibly emotional and uninformed people on the pro-wolf side that are going to make a lot of decisions, a blanket decision that's not really that good for um, certain sectors of a minority of the population because of the votes. Obviously, I'm talking majority minority voting here that is going to make it very tough in that state for the anti-wolf people which can be just as emotional and and uh you know anti-data as the extreme wolf pro wolf people can so i'm for wolf i am pro state management but it's very complicated and that's that's just kind of where i'm this could be a dang three-hour talk because i think wolves do have an important role to play on the landscape as far as a mediator between predator prey balances and uh, I think they have an important role to play as far as general ecosystem health in ways that people would never think about. For instance, pronghorn populations are depressed in areas that wolves are absent or extinct because coyotes prey heavily on baby antelope and wolves prey heavily on coyotes. So wolves don't even try to catch antelope. They don't even try to catch pronghorn. They're way too fast. Mm -hmm. But they don't also don't follow pronghorn does when they're dropping their baby. So the BLM pays tons of aphis hunters to go out and shoot coyotes that follow pronghorn herds to eat the fawns right when they drop. And in areas where wolf populations have been recovered, the pronghorn population also recovers. But can, these a, are things, the, but can a wolf wolf follow a pronghorn herd? And, they don't do it. They just don't do it. That's just something that they don't, they don't do. It's like just a coyote. too much energy exertion. No, it's, it's, no or... it's just, it's just not what they do. I mean, like the, I mean, observational data doesn't lie and they just don't do that. Coyotes are what you call a meso carnivore. They're a mid-level carnivore mm -hmm. and they're a lot more opportunistic and utilize prey bases and resources a lot differently than a wolf does. Coyotes spend a lot of their time foraging, eating like non-meat and sources of food. And, and one way they do is they, they capitalize on food sources that a wolf would never even attempt or try because it's either a, not calorically like why would a yeah lauren yes your point is exactly right why would a wolf pack follow a pronghorn herd for like two weeks to when it drops a single little fawn that like three or four 65 pound canids are like going to get nothing out of it for but when a one single coyote follows it when it, she drops a three or four pound calf that's a pretty good meal mm -hmm. for a for, for a single 28 pound coyote following a pronghorn herd they'll keep him fueled be, up for a few days until the next one drops easy and he's going to be hunting rodents and lagomorphs like rabbits and stuff mm -hmm. as he's following that herd along so like it's just not it, it's just not important so back to what i was saying um managing and, and i want to just state i'm 100 percent pro wolf hunting like legalized north american game model management hunting for wolves 100 pro and i think that satisfies so many levels of important wolf management that can make everybody happy the wild horse is a perfect example of that. It's illegal to hunt wild horses. It's a federal ban on hunting wild horses, yep. which is absolutely absurd. Wild horses do an incredible amount of damage to the landscape, and the BLM spends a massive portion of their budget to pin, medicate, and feed these wild horses that they remove from ranges in Nevada, from the Wyoming, from the Dakotas. So 
why, like, why wouldn't it make sense to also manage wild horses like we manage? And they're elk not native here? to the area. Either. Yeah, and it's okay because again, horse activists are like pretty intense, uh, and so why is it? That's as touchy as the wolf. Absolutely. Maybe more so because every worse. little girl, Way worse. every every Way worse. every little yeah, kid's my got little a pony. Yep. They've and got that the poster of My Pretty Pony on their wall. Yeah, horse, horse people, people are rich. rich. Yeah, and so they have money to throw at legislation. You know what I mean? Hippies mm-hmm. that love wolves, they're not as rich as like, you know, rodeo or uh, like equestrian stars that have like huge stables and stuff. Anyway, I so don't like know. if you <laughs> if you manage wild horses like we manage elk and deer, there would still be wild horses on the landscape because elk have only ever been increasing since we started managing them effectively and reintroduced them on a wide scale in the early 1900s. So managing wolves and wild horses using the North American game model through sound science with population targets that match political, cultural, societal norms, goals, you can... And get... and the carrying capacity of the land. Oh, well, that's the thing is true, but for wild horses, that's a lot more important than for wolves because we'll never reach the carrying capacity for wolves. Cultural society won't allow it, which right. is fine. That's right. fine. I mean, that's part of life well, dominating. If by you humans. take if you take somebody that from Northwest Montana, who in the heyday of the Rocky Mountain elk, uh, they could drive down any road and and see a herd of thirty or forty elk, or a hundred elk, and then they've watched the demise of that elk herd since the wolf repopulated the mountains around the Flathead Valley. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, hatred there. I understand that, but at the same time, they're also probably not seeing the positive impacts to the entire system that dispersing those elk, removing those elk, and causing those elk to utilize a habitat differently caused. So, like, I understand that in the last fifty years, people have gotten very used to an artificially inflated number of elk on the landscape, and as an elk hunter. I I understand like, but at the same time, it's, um, it's all depends on views on how you want the landscape. Look, I'll be very honest, uh, how you're never going to get sympathy from me for, for having to go out and hunt elk. I I mean, if you're driving down the road and seeing herds of 40 elk on the side of the road all the time, that's great. And that may be like a local phenomenon or a migration area or something, but look, there's too many elk in, in many local areas. There's too many elk utilizing areas i know here in the gila ask cattle ranchers they'll talk about how elk are a huge competitor for cattle and Mm -hmm. wolves have a very important role to play of moving elk pushing elk around and yes unfortunately for some people that want to see floods of elk they are going to reduce the elk numbers but they're also not going to eat elk to extinction that's insanity elk were here before humans were here and there was way more wolves and way less elk locally, depending on your population. So you, you brought up an interesting point there. You brought up the cattle rancher. So that's the cultural part because right. th- that rancher is only going to tolerate he, – he's he's trying to tolerate elk competing with that mouthful of grass for his cow because okay. I'm sh- sure the Gila is – I'd hate to say what the uh, carrying capacity for cattle is out there. It's probably what one to – one cow to how many acres? Really depends on the area in the Gila, but some areas can be as low as one cow calf pair to fifty four acres. Other areas can be one cow calf pair to ninety or one hundred and twenty. Right. So, I mean, yeah, there's a reason that those ranchers have to actually feed yeah. their herd on pasture. Oh yeah. And why some of those cows don't look good. Right. Oh, and if you get down in the desert where I'm at, it's ugh, infinitely worse. But right. continue, Chris. So you've got you've got the rancher that's already competing with the elk. And so you would think that naturally he would want the wolf there to, or some help reducing that. But now he's got another alpha top of the food chain predator that is going to potentially cause damage to his herd. Mm -hmm. So that's the cultural battle that, that wildlife managers find them in, find themselves in is Mm -hmm. one day you've got, you've got a person complaining about elk and then that same person is complaining about a predator that can reduce the elk, but there's also the potential for the cow, you know, to right. be the to be the meal. That's right. And and that's again an incredible it's a lot harder to be a wildlife manager than people may think. We're not running around playing with butterflies. <laughs> so yeah. in you know, Wisconsin it's it's 
not quite the same problem. Right. Yeah. And and the thing is, what if you want to become a better anti or pro wolf activist, go down and look at good peer reviewed data. It's everywhere and it's available to the public. What go kind of data? USDA, peer reviewed data. So that's data that's been published by a reputable scientific organization that has been in, looked in at. Journals, in journals. Exactly. Yeah. Anything published in a journal has been looked at by multiple PhD level wildlife biologists, way smarter and higher level than me that have um, like weighed out pros and cons on that and can refute it or disprove it. And it won't even reach a journal until it's been widely recognized through the scientific consensus as being good data. And, mm -hmm. and for instance, and this is something I really wanted to touch on, for wolf diet composition in the blue range, which is the mountain range that borders the Gila in New Mexico, in Arizona, so the blue range is in Arizona, they had specially trained dogs that looked for wolf scat. So you had these sniffer dogs that are looking for carnivore poop in general, specifically wolves, but they find everything else. Coyote poop, mountain lion poop, bear poop, wolf poop, all kinds of small raccoons, ringtails. And you put that scat in a machine called a stable isotope ana analysis machine that breaks down the feces into a molecular structure that can be analyzed. So you're putting turds in a blender. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Uh, a many, 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 many times more expensive than your ninja. <laughs> <laughs> and so it can break down the molecular structure of that feces to tell you the DNA of what it's been eating, which is freaking amazing. So, like, you can, I could pluck one of your hairs, put them in that machine, and give you a breakdown on a pie chart based on the genetic material of what's in your hair follicles, because keratin stores that material in a long term data bank. And I could tell you what you've been eating. And what's hilarious is when you do that for Americans, the majority of our diet is corn, which you're like, I don't really eat that much corn. Yeah, corn do. products are in everything. Yep. So anyway, a wolf, the majority of their prey in the Blue Range, and this was published in 2011, the majority of their prey in the Blue Range, what is it? Anyone want to guess? Wolves? The Mexican yeah, wolf? Yeah, wolves. Majority of their, yeah, Mexican gray wolves. Majority of their prey. And the, it's the Rabbits. Hero. Rabbits. Uh, I have no idea. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say ringtails. <laughs> it's elk, actually. Okay, I didn't want to go yeah. there. I thought that so, was too obvious. Yeah, yeah. So it's elk, and then next up is feral horses because there's a lot of feral horses in the in the Blue Range, believe it or not. And then the next one is deer. Then it's coyotes. Then it's cows. So yeah. you and and that was a very small section of their their diet, and so. They definitely eat cows. I do get sick of people saying that like, oh, you know, they only, it's like people say sharks. They're like, a shark only eats like five people a year. I'm like, yeah, but they still eat people. You know what I mean? And right. they still will eat people if people are available. Yeah. And so like, but anyway, it was pretty cool. If you looked at a mountain lions, there's a sidebar. I just thought this was awesome. The second most common thing that mountain lions eat in the blue range is coyotes, which is like, wow, that's crazy. Anyway, catching a coyote would be hard with your face. Yeah. But anyway, so, um, yeah, so I was going to get back to that, is that both sides need to arm themselves with data and try not to interpret them through your own, like, personal or political lens as much as possible to, like, try to, like, get a well-rounded view. Because I think the best way to move forward, and this is what the entire North American model is based on, is multiple use. We can have wolves. We can have robust populations of elk. We can have ranchers that are supported by the community for those appropriate losses by wolves. And we can have a range where non-hunters and, and people that don't use the wildlife in a, in a consumptive way can also enjoy this animal that has this incredible cultural, societal, and political view. We can all win, but all of us are going to lose in the process a little bit. You know, a good compromise is going to be a little hurtful for everybody. But I think there is a win for us all around, but we all need to kind of unentrench a little bit. And this is the last time you'll ever Seth Hall, hear Seth Hall on the Houndsman XP podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's hard to it's hard to convince somebody that has lost hounds that it's okay to have wolves. You know, and and yeah. it's all going to be part of this big this was but uh, let me let me let me fin let me finish. <laughs> So a lot of times I think biologists along with uh along with some of these anti-hunting crowds 
you know, a biologist wants to restore things a lot of times to this utopian society of all things can survive here. And that can't always happen because, like you said earlier, people dominate the world. We rule the world. So there's going to be some things that just can't be. And it's Either hard. This, this is such a, you know, it's such a difficult topic because it's 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 like it's been forced down the throats we talked about the general you know broad blanket management plan well when they put something on the endangered species list the sl once they make that list you got you run a risk if you you got to live with it law of land you got to live with it and the wolf was forced down the throat of of western people and northern Wisconsin, Michigan people, and it's your problem. You get to deal with it now. It's killing your dogs. It's killing your cows. It's killing your sheep. And so, Horses. yeah, I mean. I'm going to interject real quick. I'm going to play devil's advocate for you because I, I don't want anyone to think that I'm some, like, callous, anti, or, like, pro-wolf person. Yes, you are. But <laughs> <laughs> any biologists I work with, definitely the, the utopia that everyone thinks is, like, this, like, liberal heaven is like totally ridiculous for any kind of real wildlife people because that, that, that notion shifts. And I know you weren't grilling me in particular, but like what I mean is that notion shifts as human society shifts. We wouldn't even be having this conversation in 1950. You know what I mean? This yeah, there weren't wolves here. The, exactly. Throw strychnine out if there is any. Yep. You know what I mean? So like what I mean is, is um, we can go back to conservation for our own opinion because – conservation isn't about the individual deer. It's about the deer population as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. So really, conservation doesn't care about your opinion on wolves. Conservation cares about the entire society's opinion on wolves. And so the individual, and again, this is just, I'm just being a blanket data gray guy right now, just to put out an example. (laughs) This is not Seth Hall's hardened opinion. I'll tell you when it is. But like, no one really cares if your dog gets eaten by a wolf in a microchasm. They care about like the overall, like the monetary, the economic, the political, the cultural, societal views on that animal as a whole. And so, again, my personal view is that referendums and discussions where people aren't being like totally insane is the best way to move forward with wolves. I do believe there are places in the United States where wolves do not belong. Now, I also do believe there are places we don't in the need States. wolves in Bear Branch, Indiana. <laughs> well, we definitely no, we don't. We definitely <laughs> don't. We don't need wolves in many places in the east, if not all places in the east, because right. that is an animal that needs an inordinate amount of land to be healthy and have a population that's worth anything. Right. And so, I don't need wolves three three miles from my house here. You know, the but, thing is, is like <laughs> wolves also do belong in places where people don't want them, and that's a sad, bitter pill to swallow for some people. Like when you have, you know tens of millions of acres of public land that's public land and and that's a huge area for an animal like a wolf to live with a small robust population and i say small because this is an animal that needs dozens if not hundreds of square miles of territory for a pack of six Mm -hmm. so like get real when you have a three and a half million acre forest you're not going to have hundreds of them in here and if they leave these designated areas where they have management plans, units, hunting units that all of us know about. We're going to ramp up hunting units in areas where we don't want them. And that's part of it. And that's why I am, this is my opinion, I'm pro-delistation of the animal and I'm pro-state management. As long as competent and data-driven professionals are at the helm of making those calls that are open to listening to political and societal views. Points Which on that doesn't animal. happen a lot in bureaucratic organizations. You know, it can. and that's why that's why you're probably not going to see a wolf season in Wisconsin anytime soon, because it would be a political nightmare for the for the uh, sitting government in Wisconsin. Well, yeah. And unfortunately, like if you want to get elected in Boulder, you're not going to run on an anti, uh, you're not even going to run on a middle of the ground wolf strategy. No, which is like so ridiculous. And, you know, and, and you're not going to. And in and in like the far eastern border of New Mexico or the far western border of New Mexico, you're not going to run on a, hey, guys, like, I'm sorry, you're probably going to lose like maybe five or six cows over the year to some wolves. But, hey, you know, we can get some government money coming to you. You're not going to say these things. You know what I mean? You're not going to sit down and I wish you could. 
we could all sit down and have a really long, boring, data-driven conversation about it. But yeah, but like, the government money is my money and your money and everybody else's money. It's so, so complicated. Yeah, the, it's, the, it's complicated. The title of this podcast is going to be called It's Complicated. Uh, <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that most houndsmen and most outdoorsmen, hunters in general, um, just don't want to be told – just sit back and and watch. You can't participate. We can put this animal. We can use a North American model for this deer. We can use it for this elk. We can use, it, but we can't use it for the wolf. You know, the wolf is special. We can't use it for that. You know, <laughs> yeah. that, that is that's hypocritical. It doesn't ring true with people. But at the same time, I think if if states will put an effective management plan in place to allow the management of the wolf population, then we will get used to it and we will, it's, it's better than where we've been, but, um, there's risks every time you turn a hound loose. It could be the road. It could be an alligator in the South. It could be, there's always a risk. It could be a snake bite. Um, you know, there's all kinds of risks that go there. And I think the main thing from the houndsman that I talked to is, don't just handcuff us and tell us we can't do anything with it. You know, let's do something to at least manage this this thing. I totally agree. And I think and, and there's people that don't have the boots on the ground that aren't seeing what we're seeing. Most don't. And it's just they're formulating their know. opinions off of off of memes on Facebook. I mean, correct. yeah, that's that's I just, where they're, I just it's don't an emotional be told by someone who. <laughs> works in an office downtown Milwaukee that has never been hunting in their life about wolf management. Exactly. And my, my thing is, is why do they get a say? I, that's a part of the North American model of wildlife conservation that I've always struggled with. First precept, you know, the, the wildlife belongs to the people. And that means the person that's sitting in the office in downtown Milwaukee and they get a say and they've mm -hmm. never put a dime into it. They think because you know, they shared a post on Facebook about the humane side of the United States that they're animal lovers and they need a say. Yeah. And, and they don't contribute to nothing, you know, the funds, nothing like they don't buy hunting license, fishing license or like uh, ATV, UTV access trail, anything like that. It's just like, yeah. it's just like the, so, this is a sidebar, but the backpack tax, you know, people are, yeah, if they're going to be in the forest sale, they'll have to pay something. Well, why not tell them to buy a hunting license? Yeah, so in New Mexico, you can support because this is a, a really big um, bullet in the gun for when people talk about how hunting is cruel to animals. And I don't I like killing animals and not caring about animals on the landscape. I say, well, how much money have you contributed to conservation? Exactly. I spend a thousand dollars in licenses every year. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so New Me in New Mexico, you can actually um, buy special license plates and you can buy special um, gears that people that don't hunt can contribute to New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. Like, for instance, right. all the license plates on my car have like animals on them and they're like, spe yeah, whatever. Anyway, the point is, is that we contribute infinitely more. But I also like to just put a fun fact in here that the Pittman-Robertson Act, which if you're not familiar with that, everyone go out and read about it. It's really important and it can really bolster any hunter's argument for why hunting is amazing in America right now, this is the golden age in hunting right now, is because, or I'm sorry, is that target shooters actually benefit the most to us from the Pittman They Robinson. contribute. They contribute the most. They do. Yes. Because ammunition sales. And so yes. tar your buddy who's blasting away with his AR-15 at the range and just shot like a thousand rounds of ammunition in one day, he is the main reason, statistically yes. speaking, that we have amazing like funded federal, well, amazing funded. We have well-funded federal and state level organizations to protect wildlife. Yeah, so sports, target shooters, you rock. Yeah, sports <laughs> shooters contribute much more to the Pittman-Robertson Act than the average hunter. You know, the yes. average hunter has got the same box of 270 bullets, you know, for 270 rounds for three seasons. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy that's a sports shooter just burned up 1,500 rounds in a weekend. So yeah, I get it. So let's talk real quick. We got to wrap this up, but let's talk about how it's going to look. I was from... just getting warmed up. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. Um, I really haven't gotten to talk at all yet. So 
La- well, thing. you're going to now. Lauren, I want you to talk about what Wisconsin has done since the delisting because you were involved in that. You've got a lot of information. And uh, tell us a little bit where where they're at right now. Um, so the, you know, species was federally, federally delisted. Sorry, I've got my guard dog on alert here. There was stuff going on outside. Um, and, you know, there's a ton of chatter all, after all that happened. And there's something called the Wisconsin Conservation Congress, which I was going to run for. And then COVID happened and they decided... We'll just leave that all for next year. Anyway, um, this Congress is like an advisory board to the DNR, Mm -hmm. and it's made up of just civilians like us, Uh, and then they have uh, subcommittees. So there's a wolf committee um, that meets, and there's resolutions that are brought to this committee. One of those resolutions, which comes through, you know, every time that, you know, wolf season is a potential in Wisconsin is to ban... Uh, the use of dogs for hunting wolves. And so that was part of the meeting that was had, what was that, Seth, two weeks ago? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was about two well, weeks ago. Yeah. It was actually it was actually just a little over a week ago because it was when I was with, uh, it, when I was in Michigan hunting hair. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so um, these people from the metro counties, we'll put it that way, so like... Waukesha County, which is a metro, uh, uh, right by Milwaukee, Racine County, which is right by Milwaukee, brought forth these resolutions, and they get their three or five minutes to testify, and then the committee discusses it and votes, and it was rejected, but the funny thing is, is their argument and their information in there was just emotionally charged. And it was false. And they were just kind of grabbing at straws. And we need to realize when people are doing that and to not let things advance, you know, to a higher level within the DNR. And, you know, part of their argument was, which I mentioned on a tailgate talk, was that it's like dog fighting, like pit bull fighting in the city. Mm -hmm. And it goes against the Animal Cruelty Act when uh, it's been proven that stuff like that doesn't happen because they've done necropsies on these wolves and their hides. And it, it's, it's not like dog fighting. Um, You're talking about talk- hunting, hunting wolves with hounds. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, they also talked about um, it disrupting like wolf pups and the rearing season and wolf's pups are full grown by the time a wolf season would happen. So it's not like they're going over and, you know, taking down five pound wolf pups. Mm-hmm. Um, one of their other arguments was the payout. So in Wisconsin, um, if your dog is proven to be a, be killed by a wolf, in the pursuit of bear or anything else or just out and about, you're entitled to uh, some compensation. And, you know, they made it seem like, oh, well, all these dogs are going to be killed when they're hunting wolves. Well, if your dog is in a pursuit of in pursuit of wolf during wolf season, no, you're not going to be paid out if wolves killed your dog. Mm-hmm. So there's a bunch of things that they brought forth that played on emotion of people who are not educated on it, which not everybody in the committee was aware of or, you know, kind of picked up on, like, hey, red flag, like, that's wrong. Um, So there's people on the committee that are hound hunters as well and that were able to speak to a lot of those points. So it was uh, voted on and um, rejected, long story short. Mm -hmm. And going forward as far as like hounds are concerned that's off the table right now um so tell me what was rejected a wolf management plan was rejected or just the ban on hunting wolves with hounds okay so wisconsin is proceeding with the process of establishing a management plan for the wolf well we actually already have a plan in place okay Um, we've had previous seasons on wolves uh and 
dogs have been a part of that. Um, you know, other method, methods, trapping, et cetera, have been a part of that. And we have that plan that's written. Um, and so the plan is there. I haven't heard, you know, there's probably plenty of other people who could speak to this better than I can, but I haven't heard of changing any part of that plan for the future. Okay. Um, I think what's happening is we're waiting to see if anybody, the government or whatever, gets sued and a judge overturns um, the delisting, which is what has happened in the past when Obama and Bush administrations um, tried to delist the wolf, right? I'm not familiar. That's what I heard. I'm not familiar yeah, with. So, I know that yes. they're, you so know. The Obama administration tried to do the same thing now that, that the Trump administration has done, and it the judge overturned it. Okay. Um, so that there's still the potential to that have that happen. Um, and I think, you know, Wisconsin has their plan in place and we're, we're kind of just waiting to see if we can pull the trigger on it or not. Gotcha. So speaking generally about this, you know, just because a wolf has been delisted doesn't necessarily mean that your state is going to allow taking of, of wolves, you know, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, just because it's been delisted doesn't automatically your your state government does wildlife managers don't have to allow the taking of wolves in the state. That's so, correct. So, um, and when it does happen, you know, especially in Wisconsin, I think a lot of uneducated people think it's just going to be like coyotes, where anybody can go out and anybody can shoot them. But, hey, guys, it's like bear. You have to apply for preference points, and you have to have enough points and win in the lottery to be able to get your tag. It's not like anybody can just go buy a wolf tag and you can just go smoke them. That's unfortunate. You know, it's it's <laughs> there's, there's a methodical way to go about it. I mean, I would hope that if I was out in the woods and I got to a tree and wolves came in or wolves were already there when I got there, I would be in the right to be able to shoot them every single one of those things. And no one could come after me for doing it because a, yeah, I'm defending myself and I'm defending my, my Your livelihood, property. my dogs. Mm -hmm. my yeah, property. You can in New Mexico, if that happens, you can blast them. Yeah. yeah. If they're, if they're coming after your tree hounds, you can lay them out. So I totally agree with you by the way. Anyway. Um, yeah. So, so the, the, the point that I was getting to was, now is the time, you know, to you ha you already have one hearing, and I'm talking generally speaking across states that have uh, a wolf population that that houndsmen want managed or hunters want managed. Now is the time to start building those relationships with the people sitting on those panels, like in Indiana, it's yep. the the it's natural start getting involved. Yep, natural resource commission. It, it, they can't. You need to develop relationships now. I've been to several Natural Resources Commission hearings over my career and with my involvement with the the uh, Who's Your Tree Dog Alliance. And it seemed like, you know, there were certain guys that could get up and when the person sitting at the table, the, the chairman of the organization, can say, hey, Charlie... Have you got anything you want to add? That is so much more effective than having to get up and say, my name is Chris Powell and I'm with the Hoosier Tree Dog Alliance and this organization. If you don't have to say all that stuff because the people sitting in those chairs already knows who you are, then you are going to have more credibility uh, to, to speak to those issues. So now is the time to be developing those relationships getting to know those people uh it's like it's like my state legislator told me one time he goes it's much more important for me to know who you are than you know who i am you know he needs to be if i want to be effective and an influencer with him then he needs to know me when he sees me at walmart or he sees me in a restaurant out in town or whatever and it's the same way with these people sitting on these committee meetings. If you're just showing up to raise hell and and state your case, 
then you're not going to be effective and you're not going to influ- influence these people effectively. But if you and, take some and, time now and start building those relationships, you we can have influence on this thing. Yeah, and don't always be that person that's, you know, going in there guns blaring. Work on other things too, not just, you know, whatever you're against. Maybe you're on a committee for managing XYZ Marsh mm-hmm. in general or, you know, fundraising for whatever event. Yep. Um, do whatever, yeah. yeah. So like, like do, do whatever you can, like maybe you can't do as much as, you know, some of these people on the committee that I listened in on, but be more than just even a member of whatever it is, the Wisconsin bear hunters association. Right. Right. Be more than just paying your dues. Well, if you are a member of the Wisconsin Bear Hunters Association, you need to be asking your leadership, what are you doing about this? And are you building relationships now with these people? And why aren't you? Because that's if you're a member and you're paying, then those are the questions that you as a member, not an officer, not in a leadership position, but you can be asking those questions now because you are a member Right. Yep. Yep. Good point. So, and, 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 you know, maybe, you know, another thing you can do is just get out and talk to people, not always just people in those leadership roles or in those legislative positions, but, you know, be like me and talk to your friends that sit in those stupid office seats downtown and educate them on stuff. And they're like, Oh wow. I didn't, I get it now from that perspective or whatever it is. Like, If you just go out there and go into the woods and that's all you do and you're keep to yourself about it, yeah, you're having a lot of fun and you're doing what you like, but, you know, what's going to be left at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. Also, hear them out. Hear what they're saying. And although you may internalize that being like, "Ah, that's a bunch of malarkey, remember, that is what people feel, think, and say. And that person probably did not generate that opinion independently. So use that as a preparation for your own critical thinking on how to defend our position even more eloquently. I think that's also incredibly important. Don't just disregard everything they say is garbage. Remember, that's how someone feels, and that's really important to base our defense on how we feel. So I always try to take what people say seriously, even if I don't agree with it. Good point. Good point. And that's a good good, uh, good leadership principle is to be able to listen and critical thinking so good stuff mm-hmm. guys and being I, able to to, to be, word yourself correctly and not just be all fired up all the time either right yeah i mean everybody wants to leadership that's passionate but man i can tell you that it, if if you're the guy that comes into a meeting and every time you're there willing to die on your hill and yeah. and you know, come in guns blazing every time. It's going to be like, oh boy, here we go again. Yeah, right. Yeah, you're you not know? doing nothing. Channel nope. your inner Clarence Darrow. That is what you need to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's wrap this thing up. I I think we've we've uh, beat this thing enough for this. I week. mean, it, it's 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 definitely going to be interesting to follow. You know what happens in the next in the next month and a half. Very much agree. Um, and see what happens. I mean, I would love to eventually you know be able to get a wolf and and say i contributed yes yeah that would be awesome i would love to hunt a wolf too yeah well you got any final thoughts seth um it's complicated (laughs) i think um we covered a lot of good ground and i think one important thing to remember is that you know moving forward it's always kind of weird and one thing i've always kind of internalized is that you're not going to agree with everything other people say all the time. And you're, you know, like you don't even agree with your own wife a hundred percent of the time. So like your views are going to be challenged and mine agrees important. with me. <laughs> and then you woke up <laughs> and then, so, um, you know, I guess the point I'm trying to say is like, uh, um, get organized, be, um, be thoughtful, be rational and be ready. You know what I mean? Because um, this is not obviously going to go away anytime soon. And I think this is a great time to um, help the world view hound hunting and hunting lifestyle in general in a positive way. Because we everyone can win if we just 
move forward intelligently. And that's kind of where I'm going to wrap it up. We got Lauren. Um, you know, I, I uh, got to say a couple things here at the end and I, I don't have a whole lot. I mean, I'm, I'm excited for things to hopefully be brought down to the state level um, to be managed that way. And I, I think in the beginning, you know, hopefully it'll, it'll be successful and we need to look at the long term too. So, you know, it is what we can do now, but what's going to work long term. Yeah. I don't know. Well, so. people, people I'll wrap it up with this change is something that, that people resist. Um, unless it's abundantly clear and it's beneficial to them. And I think too many times um, we don't we don't look at things objectively. And this is a this is a good thing if we if we do it correctly. We may not get everything we want, but anything at this point, any I I felt like when I saw the delisting that it was a major victory for. Um, outdoorsmen all across the United States and now it's just time to get down to the grassroots level through our state organizations and things like that to make effective changes and be influencers in an effective way that we can have a a good management plan that's based on the science and the data and what's best for the resource and not some emotional, uh, you know, uh, stopgap method, you know, plan that's loosely thrown together. So or blanket method. Yeah, for that or a blanket too. method. Yeah, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. Because it's it's like like we've said, it is complicated. You've got to you've got to manage the cultural impacts as well as the biological impacts with with issues like this. So it's not going to be an easy task. Now's the time to get started on getting to know the, the, the decision makers. And by building those relationships, you can be an effective influencer. So took the words right out of my mouth. Yep. Love it. I yep. agree 100%. Well, Lauren, why don't you wrap this thing up? Well, Chris, you're going to follow your hounds. And Seth, so are you. And uh, tomorrow night, I'm going to go follow mine. I'm going to go follow mine right now. I think I'm going to get out of here. And I don't have a coon dog on the place. Can you believe oh, that? No. What? I've got some bear. I've got some plot dogs <laughs> that will tree a coon, but I don't call them call them coon dogs. And so. this was the last time you ever heard Chris Powell on the Hounds and XP podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, guys. Hey, it was awesome. You follow your hounds. I'll follow mine. We're out. <laughs>